Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation uh, webinar. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the um, Foundation. Now, we've not been doing many events or publications at present for obvious reasons that the attention of everybody, not just in the square mile where we're based in the middle of London, but across the country is focused elsewhere for good um, reasons. And the passing of the Queen is obviously leading to lots of things, including the new king, huge pan pageantry going on right as we speak. The uh, procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall is taking place before the lying in uh, state. But there's also, as well as all that pageantry, lots of reflections taking place, some of them specific about a life well lived, but lots of it also about the big picture of change that's taken place over the long decades of the Queen's life. The, um, you'll probably all have heard one of my favourite stats that's been used over the course of the last week, which is, uh, this is a monarch whose first Prime Minister was born in 1870, and who, uh, whose last Prime Minister took office just last week, and that is a staggering period of time. Now, given those discussions and those reflections, we think it's fitting that we're going to be today discussing a big picture sweep of economic and political history that covers actually exactly that same time period of the Prime, Minister, of the Prime Ministers that Queen Elizabeth saw through. Now, we're going to be doing that because, uh, by coincidence, uh, a book covering exactly that time period has just come out. And it's written by Brad DeLong, Professor of Economics at Berkeley, who's a Hopefully, he doesn't mind being called a polymath. There aren't many of them left these days. Thank former you. Treasury, Thank you. former Treasury uh, Minister in um, Clinton's administration in the 1990s, and hopefully, all of you who were paying attention in the 2000s also saw him playing a large part in the takeoff of economics blogging. While it, before it was fashionable, the um, uh, it, but, well, I'd say the golden age of economics blogging, probably. But since everybody's moved on to Twitter and had to trans shorten their thought patterns since then. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to talk about. And he's written a book. Here it is, Slouching Towards Utopia, an Economic History of the 20th Century. Now, it's a long period, so it's a big book. Quite, really quite big there, which Brad can defend uh, later on. 224 pages. Very good. OK, there, so it's a yes. big book. Um, and just like the Queen's Prime Ministers, it begins in 1870. Uh, despite the 20th century title, uh, subtitle, it's a redefinition of the 20th century to gain another 30 years of the 19th century. It's a big picture, big argument, not just a uh, big book. And it's what Brad will come on later to describe, but it, what he calls a big narrative, a narrative history of the economic history. And the, that interaction of how technology and economics weave <laughs> together with politics and ideology to give us the outcomes that uh, we all spend our time focusing on in our day-to-day -day economic uh, research. I have to say, it's also it's not just that it's a big argument, it's actually packed with lots of great trivia. So even if you didn't like the big argument, I think you would take a lot away from it. I, for example, didn't know that Herbert Hoover lived in Britain for over a decade before he wandered back to the United States to become the president in the 1920s. Now, given how that turned out, maybe he wishes he'd stayed in Britain, as all sensible people that have come to live here for a bit probably um, should. So you go for the trivia as well as for the big picture argument. Now, in terms of the plan for this session, we've got about an hour. So in a second, I'm going to ask Brad to give us a 10 minute summary of the 140 or 100, how many, how many thousand words you told us it was just now, Brad. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, because this is a webinar. Uh, unlike our usual in-person events, you can go on to Slido to engage in that discussion, to ask questions and to vote in the polls. So go on to Slido.com and the hashtag is economic history. And then your activity shouldn't be just limited to engaging in the discussion. You can buy the book, which you can do on the website. But there's a because of very high inflation at the moment, we're going to do our bit to control that with some discounts. So if you look on the web page for this event, you'll see the details of how to buy the book at a significant discount because it turns out price controls are back in fashion despite what everyone thought a few months ago so that is the plan for today so to kick us off brad what is in this great big book all right well let me say that the book starts not in 1900 but in 1870 because of something big that happened in 1870 um, halfway between in the during the reign of queen late, late Queen Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother, is that the right number of greats, Victoria? Um, that is, before 1870, you know, there had been the Industrial Revolution century centered in Britain, and that had been a wonderful thing in terms of the advance of human technology and the increase 
in prosperity in the Dover Circle, in the area 300 miles around the port of Dover. Um, but was it sustainable? Of all the income improvements in the Industrial Revolution century before 1870, um, a third had come from the technologies of steam, iron, and textile machinery, yes. But another third had come from the fact that the increasingly globalized world had allowed the concentration of world manufacturing in those districts of the world where it could be produced most efficiently and productively. And the third third had come from the uniquely lucky fact that the last round of glaciers coming down from the north had scraped off all the rock that was above the Permian era coal deposits. And so all of this stored up solar power had been assembled in the form of coal and was sitting there on the surface, just waiting to be picked up and then kind of burn in order to power the steam engines of the industrial revolution century. And those latter two were really not sustainable. You can only mine the really cheap coal once. You can only concentrate industry in the most productive industrial districts of the world once. And at the pace of technological progress left over after that, we were not yet out from under you know, the, the, the curse of the devil of Thomas Robert Malthus. Um, that back then in the age of extremely high infant mortality and a very strong patriarchy, um, if you have extra resources, you are going to think that there's about one chance in three that our family is not going to have a surviving son. And especially if you're a woman, to not have a surviving son is to have precisely zero social power um, in an age of patriarchy um, with infant mortality so high. Um, so resources devoted to expanding population rather than increasing the educational level of humanity or of building up more useful tools, implements, and buildings for us to use. Up until 1870, Humanity was stuck, you know, extremely poor, perhaps $3 a day for the typical standard of living the world worldwide, somewhat bigger in Britain in 1870, you know, but, but not going anywhere and desperately poor. All that changed in 1870. After 1870, we humans have done amazingly, astonishingly, uniquely, and unprecedentedly well at baking a sufficiently large economic pie that for the first time in history, we can look forward to a world in which pretty much everybody has enough. But there are also the problems of slicing and tasting the pie, of equitably distributing what we're producing, and then using our technological powers to live lives you know, wisely and well. Um, and those problems of slicing and tasting, you know, they continue to flummox us even though people back in 1870 and before would have said that the problem of production is the hard one. The problem of baking is the hard one. The problems of slicing and tasting are not, and they flummox us. And so manifestly, we do not today live in a utopia in spite of the enormous technological power of our civilization. You know, after all, drought and hunger and famine are still things. You know, killer robots stalk the skies above Ukraine and Syria. Um, old people find themselves you know, terrorized by those who cynically seek to glue their eyeballs to screens so that said old people can then be sold fake diabetes cures and various crypto grifts. Um, it's a world with remarkably bizarre dystopian elements as well as you know, marvelous technologies. So what's the big reason for this? And I think that most of the history since 1870 is best seen as through the lens of saying the big reason we've been unable to build social institutions for equitably slicing and then properly tasting our now more than sufficiently large economic pie is the sheer speed of the economic transformation. Um, Schumpeterian creative destruction every generation, which means our immense wealth has always come at the price of the repeated destruction of industries, occupations, livelihoods, and communities. And that we humans have been frantically trying to rewrite the 
economic institutions, sociological networks, software code that runs on top of our rapidly changing forces of production hardware, trying to cobble together on the fly a society that sort of works and kind of holds together and that does not crash given that the change in the underlying forces of production hardware means that whatever ran in terms of economic sociological software a generation ago it is buggy and crashes now. And whatever we cobble together now will be buggy and crash in a generation or so. So we have had very little success in having sociological and economic institutions that fit with our changing technology and the way we work in our daily lives and consume, very limited success. We want to think why we have very limited success. Well, you know, I think that again, um, to telegraph and to greatly oversimplify everything, attempts to cobble together a sort of running good enough roughly economic economic institutions, sociological network software code. Um, they have since 1870 been a scorched earth war between followers of Friedrich von Hayek, who say the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market, that the market economy can give us wealth, it cannot give us anything more. Try to ask for social justice as well, you know, and you end up without wealth, you know, moreover, you end up on the road to, um, well, as Hayek said, you end up on the road to serfdom. On the other side have been the followers of Karl Polanyi and all of their various sects who say that, quote, the market was made for man, not man for the market, unquote. After all, a market society, it says the only rights that matter are property rights, that the only people who have social power are the rich. But people reject that and rebel. You know, they try to vindicate what they see as their rights to stable lives, comfortable communities, and to the income and status that they deserve. You know, let the market try start destroying society, let the market start eroding people's claims to vindicate those Polanyian rights, and society will react by trying to manage and perhaps destroy the market order and the political order that backs up you know, the market. And since 1870, thus we've had social explosion after social explosion. Mm. Have we lost Brad? I fear we have. Let's hope he's going to come back on shortly. To, we've only just got started. We haven't even got to uh, the First World War or to uh, the rest of the big argument, which runs all the way up to 2010 and possibly into the last decade too. So bear with us while we try to see whether, to be fair to Brad, it is before dawn on the west coast of America right now. The, um, so we're just going to see if we can... Uh, get him back uh, with us because um, otherwise you'd only get my version of the book and that will be significantly less good than Brad's. I can see Brad now. Impressive timing from the... So if you, I need to unmute Brad and then we shall continue. Where did it cut out? It Where cut were we betrayed by Comcast Internet? This is, the, as you were saying earlier, this is the dangers of these near monopolies. The, yes. um, uh, you just got up to... Um, the uh, Hayek, and we were heading into Polanyi. Ah, yes. So I was saying that there are the followers of Karl Polanyi, you know, who say the market was made for man, not man for the market. Um, you know, that the market says the only rights that matter are property rights. Um, the only people who have the command to have their interests respected and their voice heard are the rich. You know, but people reject that and rebel. Uh, people believe they have rights to comfortable communities, you know, to stable lives, um, to the income and status, both absolute and relative, that they deserve, given who they are and how hard they work. You know, let the market start destroying society, you know, and society will react by trying to destroy the market order in its turn. 
Thus, from 1870 to 2010, as we've been trying to frantically rewrite the economic institutions, sociological networks, software code of society, um, between these two imperatives, that of allowing the market enough space to be productive so that we can actually bake a sufficiently large economic pie, and that deal with the fact that people really do not like a market society at all, you know, that's produced social explosion after social explosion. You know, thus the task of governance and politics is to try to manage and perhaps one day supersede this dilemma. After World War II, people thought for a while that at least the countries of the global north had finally found the sweet spot with what in Europe is called social democracy, with what in America historian Gary Gersel calls the New Deal order. But that sweet spot, um, that's a shotgun marriage of von Hayek and Karl Polanyi, um, which I say was also blessed by John Maynard Keynes and his urging to make full employment the first priority of governance. That failed its sustainability test in the 1970s and was succeeded by the strange thing we now call neoliberalism, which now appears to have run its course as well. Um, the task of governance and politics is to try to manage and perhaps one day supersede this dilemma, dilemma between the tensions of Polanyi and von Hayek. And yet we are no closer, I think, to figuring out how to do that than we were back in the late 1800s. And so here we are. And I guess I should stop there. That's more than enough of an introduction. That is a, uh, that's a big introduction and, a, uh, but as we said, to a um, the big topic. So there's lots of things for us to um, delve into. As I said at the beginning, you can go on and ask the bits of it you would like to delve into on uh, Slido on hashtag economic history. But I thought we would, and the questions are starting to come in already, so I shall try to do justice to those, but maybe to kick us off, it's a big narrative, so let's try to break it down into uh, consumable chunks um, for the next hour. So why don't we start yeah. with the start? Start with uh, your dating of the 20th century to 1870. Uh, now, one, I, I, the dating is brought, so the dating in the book is driven principally by when does the progress of ideas prove to be fast enough to deal with population growth? Is, mm -hmm. that, is that the entirety of the your dating? I would say yes. I'd say that has got to be what really matters. Right? That, you know, you kind of go back to Aristotle. And Aristotle talks about economics, and he says there are four branches of it. You know, and the least important branch of economics is knowing something about what determines market prices and what determined what are the possible available technologies of production. Yep. Um, the next to least important part is how to boss your wife. Um, the second most important part is how to raise your children. And the most important part of economics is how to boss your slaves. Because Aristotle says, we do not live in a world in which we have harps that play themselves and looms that weave by themselves, that we do not have the robot statues of the mythical inventor Daedalus that help him make his marvelous mechanical works, yep. nor do we have the self-propelled catering carts that the smith god Hephaestus built for the gods in which their dishes are brought to them as they lie on their couches at the banquet of, Olymp of Olympus. Um, instead, we have a low level of productivity. So if there is going to be anybody with the leisure to live a good life and do philosophy, there will have to be lots of slaves and they'll have to be bossed. And that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So that's an extractive and, it, and uh, abuse yeah. economy, basically. Yes, and that's the way it is up until 1870, that the economic pie, because of population pressure, limited resources, poor technology, slowly advancing technology, there's no chance humanity is going to be able to bake a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough. So if anyone's going to have enough, it's only going to be by becoming part of an elite and then elbowing other candidates for membership in the elite out of the way somehow. 
and then also running a force and fraud exploitation and domination game over the rest of society. And so you have the thugs with spears, their tame accountants, bureaucrats, and propagandists, you know, scrabbling for position and advantage. And, you know, maybe some of them build a high culture as well and produce something useful in the terms of art or literature or psychological insight. But, you know, that is very much the tenor of history. It is not the kind of thing that can create a truly human world. You know, and we're not even in 1870 in a position, not even in 1870 in a position to do that, right? It's 1871 when John Stuart Mill writes that all the mechanical inventions hitherto yeah. still have left he, the working class in this living the same life of drudgery and imprisonment. And that's the thing that changes in 1870. Because he's, say, he's saying in Britain, we have seen some productivity growth. Um, it's, just um, a, it's, just a, it's just that the people haven't got it. And also that, yes, it's enabled manufacturers to make huge fortunes. It's enabled a greater middle class, but, you know, Population pressure is coming. The birth rate is rising. You know, the really cheap coal has been mined. Um, industry has been concentrated. And so we're facing the wall. And remind everyone why Malthus is right and why we need more ideas to have a larger population. Why, why is this population growth sucking up? Why can't we just have our productivity growth and then share that and have a larger population doing more work but at that well, high productivity do. growth. But, you know, we had 1.3 billion people on the world in 1870 and we'd had only 500 million um, in 1500. So, you know, with 1.3 billion people, you know, your average farm, um, your average farm size is only about a third as large as it had been back in 1500. You know, um, so it's a, better it's a technology, scale. yes. You know, people being sent from Britain with pickaxes to mine guano in huge amounts yeah. off the coast of South America. And with Guano King being a kind of high-tech entrepreneurial course of status and wealth, um, kind of a bizarre agricultural nitrogen technology-based um, leading sector. Resource scarcity is a powerful thing. Um, and it was a very, very powerful thing before 1870, you know, in large part because technology was not improving that fast. And so it was you know, pretty easy for population to kind of keep up and exhaust whatever possibilities were opened. Great. Now let's turn to the what, why 1870. So what? So the fact is that ideas, technology take off at a faster growth rate. Why does it happen then? Um, well, you know, I think there are lots of reasons, lots of things that you need to have happen in order to have institution, the right institutions to support rap the rapid technological progress that we see around us. And I think that the... Um, the last three pieces of the institutional complex that they fell into place around 1870. Um, and I think they were the, the coming of the industrial research laboratory to rationalize and routinize the discovery and development of ideas. Yeah, the coming of the modern corporation to rationalize and routinize the development and deployment of ideas. And then also the coming of full globalization so that once you have ideas, once you see them applied in one factory, you can copy them pretty much anywhere else in the world. And those seem to be the last three pieces that you need. And those move us from a world in which technological progress worldwide is less than half a percentage point per year and probably falling with the exhaustion of the cheap coal, et cetera to one in which it's the more than 2% per year that we saw from 1870 to 2010. You know, and moving from less than half a percent per year to more than 2% per year to a rate of growth at which um, humanity's technological competence doubles every generation. You know, that is a wonderful thing and that makes all the difference. It does make a lot of difference. And one of the unusual, one of the unusual things to some degree about your book, I mean, it's not totally unprecedented, but unusual is the combination of strong optimism, optimism is the wrong word, but celebration of the creation of that abundance with deep pessimism about what we've, or at least disappointment about what we've managed yes. to do with it. Where lots of other people would say, 
wouldn't value the abundance and would go straight to the anger with the, the anger with the disappointment. Yes. And now if I interrupt us for 15 seconds, I hear a misbehaving puppy in the next group. Oh, right. you, bring, you, can bring a, you can bring and show us the puppy. <laughs> this is the first Resolution Foundation event that has been interrupted by a puppy. But that's despite the Resolution Foundation team lobbying very heavily to be allowed an office job, uh, office dog even. Now, there you go. Is the puppy safe? Hopefully. The puppy is safe. Ah, this is the first puppy to appear at a Resolution Foundation event. Very good. <laughs> Phew. Okay. Yeah. So we were just on. We were just on your unusual, your unusual celebration of the abundance while being disgusted by the outcome is unusual. Yes. But... Yes. You know, we have absolutely wonderful and marvelous things. You know, all kinds of incredibly, you know, um, boring and time-consuming things that used to eat up our life are now things that we accomplish with the flick of a button or a switch. Um, and this lets us have, this moves us from a world in which in 1870, something like three quarters of humanity was likely to go to bed hungry and was likely to spend a lot of their time thinking about how hungry they were and how could they get extra food. And you know, that's still a problem for 500 million people around the world. And that it is a problem for 500 million people is a scandal and a disgrace, you know, but that's only one sixteenth. That's only 6% of humanity, not 75%. Um, back in 1870, you watched half your babies die before the age of five. You know, that doesn't happen anywhere in the world today. Life expectancy everywhere in the world is 60 years and above. Back of the, of the Queens of England between say William the Conqueror and um, the woman who is supposed to be in Queen Victoria's place, Crown Princess Charlotte, you know, one in seven of them died in childbed, yeah. right? Um, childbed is a risky thing, yes, and a dangerous thing, but we do not lose one in seven of our women today to deaths in childbed. And those accomplishments are marvelous and wonderful things. Nathan Mayer Rothschild, the richest man in the world in the first half of the 1800s, you know, died of an infected abscess in his arse. Oh. Which I told, I told we you would there was cure. good trivia in this book. Yeah, we would cure by going to a clinic and they'd lance it, they'd stuff some antibiotic powder in it, they'd put a bandage on it, they'd yell at you for letting it get so bad, and you'd be off and away. Um, okay, well, that's, a, that's definitely a visible... That's a visible uh, sign of um, progress. Just on yes, it. Yes, so, yes, yes. So, a bizarre and interesting fact on every single page. Is there what is, there's, we there's, for. there's many. On your, on your, so I was trying to think the distinction between this and other attempts at his grand histories of the takeoff of growth. You give more space to the underpinnings of learning how to do ideas better than to yeah. specific ideas themselves. Some people would write the book yeah. and they'd say it was this particular technology at this particular time in this particular part of England often, or the, the Netherlands or wherever it was. And you're like, okay, that's interesting, but it's really the learning how to do. Oh, you know, but I would have loved to have had 200 pages on individual technologies and how they were devised and what their effects were. You know, when I was the knee high to a grasshopper, I was lucky enough to have the late David Landis as a teacher who wrote an absolutely magnificent book you know, called The Unbound Prometheus about precisely that, you know, technological change and industrial development in Western Europe from 1700, 1750, I think, to 1945, yep. which was absolutely brilliant. Um, look, I mean, I have 600 pages. Um, there are another 400 pages left on the cutting room floor. There are notes and outlines and quotes for an extra 600 pages as well. Basic Books would not publish a 1600 page book or even this thing. In but that also, it also wouldn't be central to your argument because your argument is yeah. it's the yeah. institutionalization of how to do ideas, not yes. the long list of yes. ideas that matters. Yes. yes, no, that it's that the institutionalization is the the invention of the process of continual and repeated invention and deployment is the big meta invention that we should focus on. 
And once we've done that, we then have the Schumpeterian creative destruction, the requirement of rewriting the soft society software code, and the fight between Hayekians and Polanyians. And, you know, that's enough of a grand narrative. Um, I enough. can't add any more and have it be a coherent book at all, you know, much as I would have loved to. And thank God I had editors. Editors are on, they're underrated. Editors who they're, would they're, say this does not work as a book. They're good inventors. Whoever invented editors was also adding value yes. to, to humanity. Whoever right. invented good editors. Good, um, sorry, yes, good editors. Yes. Very important, the adjectives we use. Right, let's yeah. take the first question from the audience. So Rachel uh, here, is gonna, we're going to bring it up on screen so you can see it. Uh, Brad and everybody else can see it, but I'll read it out. Wait, wait, which says, if our founding fathers of economics, uh, so... In your case, you're mainly talking about the 19th century founding fathers of economics. So they are almost almost, almost all fathers um, could speak. What would they say? What do you think their view, views would be about, about where we've ended up, about where our society and our markets have ended up? The, um, so what do, you, what do you think, Brad? Well, first, I think they'd be absolutely, you know, gobsmacked. Um, incredibly pleased with the enormous technological progress that are the arts and sciences that our civilization has made and with our ability to right our ability to successfully utilize that technology to produce an awful lot of you know potential be useful convenient things you know the necessities conveniences and luxuries of life um those more inclined to being narrow economists would oscillate between saying, why is the problem of income and wealth in a, why is there still so much relative income and wealth inequality on the one hand, and saying, but does it really matter, right? That the difference between rich and being poor really matters when say the poor have a diet that makes their children five foot three at adult, their male children five, their children average five foot three at adulthood, and the rich have a diet that leaves their children five foot six at adulthood. That and it's what it does to your brain, your life, your livelihood, your life expected, that's really important. But the difference between you know five foot six and five foot seven on average, which is what we have today, that even that's much less of a difference that that relative that we are now absolutely so wealthy that relative income differences they have little impact is one thing they might say. Um, to which you, the response would be, yeah, but people still think they're really, really okay. important. Um, people with a more moral philosophical bent, you know, people like Adam Smith, you know, say, who was broader than an economist, you know, would very much say, well, yes, you solved the problem of production to an amazing degree, but the problem of, you know, holding society together is some kind of equitable and cooperative institutions. Those seem to have serious problems. Um, and then there's the problem of proper utilization, that the whole idea is to use our technological powers so that people can flourish can accomplish their ends, can live their lives wisely and well. And, you know, we still don't appear to be terribly wise at figuring out how to live our lives. Um, perhaps Winston Churchill saw it most clearly, writing just after World War I, that he at least, even though he'd been in charge of the British Navy, and he had been incredibly pleased and happy about how great technological progress had been between his birth and 1914, but had really not internalized how destructive war would become. That the same technologies that had, even though he was in charge of building things that would hurl yeah. 15 inch in diameter shells tens of miles and then explode. Yeah. yeah. Let, well, let's, well, let's use that as a, a key point because I think if we, if we now try to structure the conversation going through the, the chronology mm -hmm. and learning the lessons that we take, because the, the big argument which is abundance but not utopia and the yeah. failure to get to utopia the reasons for it change over time as we move through the actual 20th century so so you give us the 1870 to broadly to the war phase yes. as the glorious takeoff phase where we learn this is yes. possible and we start to see some benefits going to not mm -hmm. just the mm -hmm. feud feudal elite or non-feudal right. elite for that matter but then we've got a phase let's do the the wars and the interregnum together where mm -hmm. 
is, if, if we take that phase, is it really teaching us that the abundance enables terrible things as well as good things mm -hmm. to happen? It does. And, and the fact that, you know, they're, you know, right, that the pre-World War I order, you know, blew itself up and blew itself up catastrophically. Yeah. And I would say it blew itself up catastrophically first because you had a um, declining aristocracy that no longer felt it had a social role. And yet if the aristocracy can solidify the country as a nationalist unit and also demonstrate that it yeah. has social usefulness by leading the country in war, you, know, you add to that um, the side effect of social Darwinism, that social Darwinist ideologies constructed to say that the rich actually deserve to live well because they are economically fit and we want the fit to survive because that's how we improve the race. The combination of those two created a situation in which one group of terrorists assassinating one Austrian royal, Austro-Hungarian royal, in Sarajevo can lead to 10 million people dying over the next four years, you know, as um, Austrian attempts to punish the Serbian government for its sponsoring of terrorism in the Balkans leads first Germany to attack Belgium and then Australia to send tens of thousands of soldiers to Turkey. Um, where they are promptly thrown into frontal attacks against entrenched Turkish positions behind barbed wire, um, a thing for which the Australians have never forgiven Winston Churchill and probably never will. Um, but, do, but does the abundance, is that a historical occurrence that doesn't relate to the growth in technology and abundance, or is it no, integral to it? It is, the, it is the fact that we had a social class that had lost its role because of changing technology and also an ideology to try to justify the past generation's social institutions kind of gone completely wrong. You know, and after World War I, there are those who say we should simply rebuild the economic and social institutions we had before World War I and they're in charge and it simply doesn't work. Yeah. And things spiral out of control in huge numbers of directions. You know, fascism, Nazism, Leninism, Stalinism. Um, practically everyone has an idea: corporatism, syndicalism, you know, thisism, thatism. Um, an enormous number of competing beliefs about how we should rewrite the economic institutions and the sociological network structure in order to make things right um, again. You know, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, in which people worship Henry Ford and make the sign of a T, but in which the business of the government is to think up new and incredibly complicated sports, each of which requires the purchase not just of a cricket bat and a ball and a couple of leg pads, but some extraordinary complicated and expensive set of you know, materials and uniforms and gear in which to play. Um, well, we're, we're definitely all doing that nowadays. People happy. What? I said the, the world is definitely, the, the global north is definitely still doing that. Well, still, though, every... still there are sports that they don't actually fulfill a Keynesian demand management role, right? We do not, we don't use except there, for, but... you know, except for bicycling and skiing. Definitely They're bicycling. not that expensive. Definitely bicycling. People spend, I, I mean, I've been watching the US spending figures the amount that you guys have been spending on sports equipment in the last two years is beyond what anyone thought was possible so maybe <laughs> may, maybe it turns out uh, it turns out they were right anyway let's move on because yeah. we'll get let's uh, so uh, somebody else trying to write a long history of the 20th century with an economic bent might say look it's not about abundance and our failure to get to utopia at the end instead it's about the big battle between capitalism or capitalism with soft edges versus fascism and versus communism and that that's the big story and that you've just wandered off into so well, why is isn't... Hobsbawm not right basically yes this is yes as you say this isn't just someone this is the great Eric Hobsbawm um you know perhaps the preeminent you know I don't know what you want to call him you born in Alexandria you want to call him an Egyptian Austrian German British <laughs> Um, well, we, we just claim him as British because we do that about almost everybody. So Yes, yeah. and he also was born a British subject in the British Empire at the yeah. time. So <laughs> claim him for Britain. Yeah. Yeah. The absolutely brilliant Eric Hobsbawm, um, who wrote this very nice book called The Age of Extremes, saying that the history of the 20th century, it is really 1914 to 1989. 
you know, and it's the tragic story of world communism, you know, born in um, war and in resistance against the inequalities and injustices of the world. Um, grows to maturity in the horrible, horrible, deadly situation of Russia after World War I, in the end expires in a enormous blancmange of bu bureaucratic incompetence, uh, but in the meantime saves the world from the Nazis, because only a paranoid psychopath like Joseph Stalin would have forced the construction of a heavy industrial complex and put it beyond the Ural Mountains, as far from Germany as possible, rather than as close to markets. And because those factories were there and because they were beyond the Urals, rather than in the Western Ukraine, they were not overrun by the Nazis in 1941. And they built the um, T-34 tanks that in 1942, 43, and 44 broke the back of the Nazi army so that you know, Montgomery and Eisenhower's soldiers were not thrown back into the sea in Normandy in June. And, you know, it's a story. It's a good story. I think his telling of it is shadowed by the fact that Eric, um, you know, Eric was a teenager in Germany at the start of the 1930s, and he would look out at the not torchlight Nazis marching by, calling for the immediate deaths of himself and all of his family. You know, and he made his social and political commitments to the Communist Party then as the only organization interested in protecting him. And, you know, that he would, to the end of his life, you know, he would, you kind of get some drinks into him and you ask him and he would say that the Soviet collectivization of agriculture was worth trying because even though it was a horrible disaster, it might have been the road to utopia. Um, you know, and I think that shadows his history and that makes him put that much in the, to the foreground. And yet I see that as simply one of the unsuccessful attempts to figure out how to rewrite the economic institutions and sociological network structure software code of society to cope with yeah. the rapidly changing forces of production in a world in which technology revolutionizes on the economic base every generation. Let's, and, you know, cool. some good ideas, some bad ideas, a lot of bad ideas about political organization in there. Um, but you just say that as the big story and you miss the bigger one. Um, you miss the bigger one because, you know, um, Leninism and Stalinism are just one of the currents of this is how we're going to manage the tension between Hayek and Polanyi. We're going to abolish the Hayek part, abolish the market and try right. to build something based on command up otherwise. And there are lots of other, and we, how should we rewrite this? This is how we should rewrite this is going on. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's wind forward the, um, because although the overall tone of the book is obviously we have failed, we have succeeded on this abundance and we have failed right. to create the utopia that we have the potential at least mm -hmm. technologically to create. The, one reading of your book is we we actually got close ish or at least we were on the route to utopia in the 30 years after the yeah. um second world war in what we call social democracy and as you say people in america hate to call social democracy but basically is a soft version of social Obviously, democracy social is a bad word in america i know it turns out it turns out like difficult socialism. okay but you can forgive we'll, we'll forgive you your linguistic kind of uh, agony but like social democracy and to some degree it reads like your view is social democracy is the answer. Not just that it was that yeah. answer, it's the answer. Well, this is what my friend Ying Yi Qian, who was here in Berkeley over the summer because he couldn't go back to Shanghai over the lockdown, yeah. um, was kind of arguing to me at coffee about a month ago. You know, that the problem is I'm basically a believing social democrat. Very so I really position. do not understand why the New Deal order fell apart in the late 1970s and was succeeded by why the world took the neoliberal turn, why so many people found Reagan and Thatcher so attractive and have continued to find their intellectual and political descendants so attractive. Um, you know, that it seems to me that after 1945, we got this shotgun marriage of von Hayek and Polanyi you know, blessed by John Maynard Keynes, with Keynes insisting on full employment as the priority, with the mixed economy agreeing the market economy as its place, but you also need to have a, a lot of social programs, a lot of public provision of, of useful goods and services for free. 
um, and highly progressive income and wealth taxes. Um, and you know, varying in different places. I remember Margaret Thatcher coming to the United States in 1993 and saying, of course, you should have universal health insurance in which everyone gets the health care they need for free. You yeah. know, we have universal health insurance in Britain and we're not barbarians which for the Republicans then fighting against Hillary care was somewhat of a shock. It was awkward. Yes. yes. Um, yet so, indeed so, so it did. Tell, that tell us why so objected to That people strongly objected to social democracy in the late 1970s and you could not gain political majorities by saying we should double down on what we've done for the last 30 years. And why not? And indeed, it was not Reagan or George H.W. Bush or Bob Dole or Newt Gingrich who said that the um, age of big government is over. It was Bill Clinton. Yeah. So why? Why did it end? If you think it is, it is at least potentially the closest to an answer you can get in the world yeah. as we've lived it, um, why did it come to an end? Well, can I say maybe you should punt this to Gary Gersel, who has a book, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal he, Order. He's not here today, so you can summarize it. If he's you like, not here yeah. today. He hasn't thought about this, I think, somewhat more deeply than I have. Um, there was the quite true belief that an awful lot of state-run companies were very inefficient, You know that social democracy was grossly over-bureaucratized. Um, there was the fact that um, the general belief that, you know, the social democratic governments handed out more tickets to claims on society um, than there were actually resources available. And so as a result, you got inflation, that inflation is the only way to square it when you've, had, when you've recognized more claims to a share of what's being produced than there are. Um, there is, in addition, um, you know, in addition, there was the feeling that an enormous number of people had used their political power to get social democracy to entrench their particular claims on the way that the world worked and had gotten unfair economic positions that got them a great deal of wealth they did not deserve at the price of making the whole economy inefficient. And there was also the very strong belief that um, the social democratic view that people should get, that there should be a basic level of income that everyone gets by virtue of a citizen. And then over and above that, if you do well on the market, you can get more. Um, a feeling that there were too many people who were taking advantage of that. That is, there were too many people who were not pulling, not you know, pulling their weight, not doing their share, who were taking advantage of the system to become feather betters and slackers. Mm -hmm. We saw this in the United States. We saw this two weeks ago or so when we saw Senator Ted Cruz denouncing mm -hmm. Biden's student loan forgiveness program as something that's going to give you know ten thousand free dollars to as um slacker barista who majored at Sarah Lawrence in lesbian dance the therapy, who really doesn't deserve to get a $10,000 present from the government. And it's a great offense to rightness that yep. she gets $10,000 while, you know, the hardworking people whom Ted Cruz wants to vote for him do not. Um, but, the, but the big that argument that there is view, that's a fairness, yeah, that's a fairness problem. View, yes, yes. Um, that and those four things, you know, inflation, rent seeking, you know, the feeling that, you know, be over bureaucratization and the feeling that, you know, indeed the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market was not a bad idea because the market does recognize virtue and hard work to some degree at least. And thus that the rich needed to be richer than social democracy allowed them to be. So they would be job creators properly incentivized to be entrepreneurial. And the poor needed to be poorer than social democracy wanted them to be because they needed to buckle down and work harder. Yeah. Yeah. And those four things, you know, they became the dominant strain that tsunami of politics in the late 1970s. 
You know, as Jimmy Carter says, yes, I want to bureaucratize and deregulate too. In fact, I'm going to deregulate air travel and trucking as a start, mm -hmm. transportation as a start on this. Um, they get then overwhelmed by the wave. And after 1980, everyone, um, even the Clintons and the Blairs, who very much, and the Milibands um, in their various permutations, who are social Democrats at their core, um, find themselves having to talk in neoliberal terms. Um, yep. You know, that then that Yingyi says, I really do not understand why that happened. And that means that my focus in the last quarter of the book is not as good as it should be. Um, well, let's turn let's turn to the last quarter of the book on the so on um uh on the neo what you call the neoliberal phase, which yeah. which you draw to a close um recently. The um well actually don't draw to a close, but you you your description of this phase with uncertainty yeah. about the future um draws it to a close. So there's quite a few questions in this space. Some of them though are on the more optimistic end. So uh you, your big discussion is obviously that that, that period hasn't and it hasn't worked broadly has not delivered what right. it was meant to even though there's some upsides versus of the specific problems it was trying to address from the 70s but it doesn't give us it doesn't keep Polanyi happy broadly mm -hmm. because people don't see it as fair that's the big picture critique of the um, right. and yes. doesn't give you investment doesn't give you long-run growth but mm -hmm. so a, a critique of that which is a version of here which is actually the 80s for some income growth in some parts of the global north is quite strong it's just it's very unequal but it's quite strong uh and maybe we the danger is that we got used to that okay growth which again it, in the uk broadly continued till about 2003 and then has slowed since the um but actually the part of the problem is we all thought we kind of wrongly thought that this phase was normal and right. now looking back at it we're rewriting today's unhappiness into the 80s and 90s but actually it wasn't that unhappy is one. In some ways, yeah. In, in some ways, this is, in fact, what Timothy Noah said in his review of the book in The New Republic, that really the thing came to an end with the neoliberal term, right? And that afterwards, we have this new normal of much lower growth, um, rather than of rapid growth in which we can grasp for utopia, if only yeah. we were a little bit richer and could distribute it a little more fairly. Um, that that's kind of over because the one big wave of huge technological advance is by and large over. Um, yeah. And that it's just that we fooled ourselves. You know, the yeah. rich and the talented and the articulate benefiting from the great rise in income inequality, they can make yeah. their incomes rise in the 1980s and 1990s. Yeah. And then the flash in the pan that was the white hot heat phase of the computer revolution in the 90s and the 00s. And after that, we get back to the new normal in which things are much more shadowed. Yeah. Um, quite possibly, certainly the engine of you know, technologically driven economic growth appears to be firing only half its cylinders since 2005. And it's still not clear to me whether that's permanent or whether that's still the shadow of the mishandling of the Great Recession um, that's driving it. Yeah, and there's quite a few now questions. We do, along those we lines. do, though we do actually have now things that were second order problems up until 2010. You know, are now first order problems. You know that um, nuclear proliferation has now reached critical mass, which is a very bad thing. Okay. Um, that the view that the United that the United States and before it Britain are in some sense a, even a semi benevolent hegemon trying to make a world that's more prosperous and more peaceful, rather than just big powers out for themselves like the other big powers. Um, that view has dropped away, and so the world is much less ordered than it was, um, and that's got to harm international cooperation. You know, plus we are failing to deal with the fact that we are cooking the planet, you know, which um, yeah. for us now means one extra unpleasant heat wave a year and some worries about drought and water availability in places. But, you know, for 3.5 billion relatively poor people in Asia, it means the monsoon this year has been in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong strength. 
to the tune of about 200 miles. And that is a potential massive catastrophe for three and a half billion people in the six great river valleys of Asia who yeah. depend on the monsoon yeah. and on the monsoon as it has been for the past 500 years. Absolutely. And, you know, that is a huge problem. Um, that, well, that is a good, let's, let's bring up a first poll along those lines actually for people to go on to slide and vote on so it should, it'll appear on your screen in a second but it's basically saying look where where are we today so are we still broadly where we are in brad's book which is we're creeping towards utopia but not getting there as fast as we would like or getting there to some degree on the abundance front but not on the utopian side of it are we actively going backwards from it so that would be the general critique of neoliberalism as a running away from utopia with not enough abundance being got for it. Uh, are you a tech optimist? We're already there. Can you believe how much stuff we've got? Even, you know, e e you know, most people are home housed, as Brad said at the beginning, lots of the problems that we thought were the core problems facing humanity have been solved. Or are you a form of humanist who thinks that this is all absolutely ludicrous, that there is no utopia, there is just humans, and humans are never satisfied, and that is the human condition? Brad, what do you think? Um, well, I reject the fourth, right, simply because having to watch half your babies die and having to go to bed hungry more than half your days and spending a lot of your time, you know, thinking, you know, that, you know, I need more food, I need some way to find more food, um, that it's better to think it's more happier, you are happier if you're thinking about other things than I really need to find more food and I can't right now. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I clearly don't think we're there, right? I mean, I remember reading utopian science fiction novels as a child, and they did not have killer robots stalking the skies yeah. or people being brainwashed by high, by mind manipulation technologies. Um, yeah. But even then, the people being brainwashed by mind manipulation technologies were being done for some purpose, you know, not so that they could be sold ads for fake diabetes cures. Yeah, that would be a obscene and bizarre and cruel twist <laughs> on even dystopia that people did not imagine. Um, yeah. Running away from utopia? No, we're not. We're not. We have enormous technological powers and we have lots of people trying to figure out how to enable human flourishing as a result so put me down as still kind of creeping okay still kind of creeping we'll see where the, the public come out on where we are mm -hmm. uh up to the um let's I, i'm trying to think how we so the other stories that are in the book but that some people would see as more central that we should raise so the role of the global north is in in the spotlight in this book because that's where because it's right. under, it's un, it's an economic story and the, yes. most of the big picture economic progress mm -hmm. is happening in the global north. So that's where the book is focused. But obviously, some of the outcomes from that are all over the world. Yes. Uh, so w where does the global south fit into this story? Um, well, you know, the global south fits into the story as something that was maybe a few steps behind um, the global north as of 1870, you know, that the first wave of industrialization was indeed concentrated in the English Midlands then spreading to the rest of England and Scotland, across to Belgium, the Ruhr Valley, um, the Northeastern United States, and then tentacles out from elsewhere after that. Um, you know, from you know, 1870 to 1975, the story is of material progress in the Global South, accompanied by enormous imperial and anti-imperial and civil war political disruptions. Yeah but growth that really does not keep up, you know, that in 1975, you know, Lant Pritchett's calculations are that the gap in wealth between the global north and the global south is, you know, a factor of four, while it had been a factor of two back in 1870. Um, since 1975, there has been a bunch of convergence um, that the global south has been drawing closer in relative terms, although it is still very far behind. But overwhelmingly, this convergence is driven by two countries, by China and India. You know, it's not that if you pick a country at random, it's gotten much richer, it's gotten richer relative to the global north between 1975 
it's that China and India have managed to do amazing things. Yeah. And, you know, together they are what? 2.8 billion people or so. Um, they're a huge chunk of the human race. And indeed, maybe the big historical event is not so much anything happening in the global north, but rather the coming of the industrial revolution to China and India around 1980. Yeah. the accession to power of Deng Xiaoping and Rajiv Gandhi. Yeah. Um, let's, um, let's go to the, f the future. Well, first of all, actually, let's bring up the results of the poll to see where everybody else came out on there. Optimism versus pessimism. And then we should go to the future, which is where the whole stuff comes in. OK, so you're all very pessimistic uh, at home on thinking that we are running away from it. I mean, Brad, just to explain, in the British context, obviously, you've had slower growth. We've right. had zero wage growth for 15 years. So the, the, uh, and it's hard and well, I'll put it, I'll put it know, um, I would say this is all the fault of those of you who voted for the Liberal Party. Right? And that oh, this is, this is your Nick Clegg bashing. Yes, I mean, basically the problem was Nick Clegg acted like a Nick Clegg. And, you know, he had enormous power to shape British policy in the late 2000s in kind of technocratic centrist, let's get the government rolling again and let's get Britain progressing again. And he threw it all away for a pointless, an absolutely pointless vote on parliamentary reform. And in return, he empowered a um, particular group of Tories who were not appealing to the center of the electorate at all. At all but who instead wound themselves wanting to say that the important thing is that those who aren't working hard aren't getting any more than they deserve. You know, and a politics, a governance that is focused on making sure that those who, that those who are slackers or are perceived as slackers by your core supporters don't get more than you, they deserve is not going to be a politics that produces any form of economic growth, and you shouldn't be surprised when it doesn't. Okay, that's a very successful. Plus, 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 then there was the fact that Boris Johnson and company decided that they wanted to stake out a flag that they were the real defenders of the British working class, working and middle classes, and not the toffs who were running the party. And so they put forward this idea for a Brexit referendum, not because they wanted to win, but because they thought they would lose, but they would demonstrate that they were on the side of the typical Britain who didn't live in central London. And, and so when they won, they were absolutely flummoxed and had absolutely no idea of what to do. And they still have absolutely no idea of what to do. This trust has no more idea of what to do than <laughs> Boris Johnson well, does, stop, who has no idea than Theresa May did. And so <laughs> you could, you elect a bunch of people who are not in the governance business, and then you are surprised. Um, so we should and you know, from my perspective, it all could have been ended. Um, you know, had Jeremy Corbyn been less of a Jeremy Corbyn or had Nick Clegg be led than less of a Nick Clegg than he was. Well, you can raise this with Nick Clegg, given that he's your neighbor in the Californian lands these days. It's true. Uh, so he, he's, your, he's yours now rather than ours. Uh, so don't wait. Anyway, now make... selling fake diabetes cures to okay. people <laughs> Allegedly. Facebook, yes. Allegedly. Uh, right. Now, on the future. So the um, so your book ends, I we should, your book ends basically by saying, here we are. Yeah. abundance but no utopia yeah it then says broadly it's not just that that's a bad situation but that we don't have a root map it's not just right. that it's not just your your pessimism at the end isn't just we're in a bad situation it's mm -hmm. that there isn't a root map out of it so my question is basically where is our Keynes? i who's writing know. the map um, do you have any young whippersnappers? I'll, 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 I'll have a, I'll have like a look. Well, obviously, the Resolution Foundation is doing its best to be Britain's case. You do. You in do. The 21st you, do century. you do. You do. You do. Look, I mean, I'm in my 60s. I'm kind of played out. It's too late for me to have good new thoughts. But you have a foundation and have young whippersnappers available. Okay, I will go. Yeah, on. I mean, clearly the neoliberal impulse seems to be played out substantially. Um, return to social democracy, to kind of making von Hayek and Polanyi have their shotgun marriage, John Maynard Keynes holding the shotgun, failed its sustainability test in the 1970s, and I see no reason it would succeed going forward. We have a challenge from, you know, um, Xi Jinping and company, 
right? Mm-hmm. Who yeah. you go to China and you ask someone what they think of Xi Jinping and they'll say, well, maybe he is not the most patient um, or the most ideal leader. But, you know, if you if you arrived at a restaurant and if you looked at the general manager and if it were Donald Trump or Boris Johnson, you would turn and run away um, on the grounds that this is not a person who is competent to run a restaurant. But, you know, you go to a restaurant and you find that Xi Jinping is running it and you're willing to sit down and eat and order something. And, you know, that that demonstrates that maybe Xi Jinping's view that we have um, marrying the market economy of von Hayek to a lend to Vladimir Lenin's political structure, all of it blessed by the concern for good and moral governance of Master Kunk. You know, the shotgun marriage between yeah. von Hayek and not Polanyi, but Lenin with Master Kung holding the shotgun. Okay. They're making a play for we actually have a better system. So the you Chinese, know, plus, so they have a plan and we don't. Yeah, plus new systemic dangers to the world in the form of global warming and nuclear proliferation. And, and if you have Will McCaskill on this, he will be add on the robot uprising, although I'm not sure why he's so scared of that. Um, that we certainly face a different situation than we saw during the 20th century when we were confident that liberalism and democracy would allow us to figure out how to slice and taste the growing economic pie, even if they hadn't done so yet. Um, indeed, can indeed back in the 1920s, Keynes was not at all sure that he was Keynes. Yeah. Yeah, back then he's the one who's calling for a Keynes because he does not have answers and yet he needs them. And he's a man with a lot of confidence, it turned out. <laughs> um, uh, right, let's wrap ourselves up with the last well, you know, the arrogance, The arrogance of someone who goes to Eton and then Cambridge as one of the few scholarship students chosen on brains at a time when he's yeah. surrounded by landlord sons. Yeah, we'll have that effect on you. Yeah. The, um, right, let's to wrap us up then on this forward looking, let's talk about the 21st century. So here's the mm-hmm. poll coming up now, which is basically, you, so you've given us a big narrative of the 20th century, and it's on the twin. But what is the 21st century about, or likely to be about, if that was the story of the 21st, the 20th century? Is it more of the same? Actually, we're going to just rerun this row because it's part of what a modern, it's 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 inherent to modern uh, human capitalism that that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, is it actually going to be something completely different? And this is the century of trying to, not about how we share the abundance of um, economic output, but instead saving the planet. Um, is it not about the global north at all? And it's just, it's about other places, other people, other uh, economies. Is it that economics is doesn't matter? And we have abundance, but we don't have cultural peace and so populism is the answer or is it something else entirely so brad why don't you give us your answer uh then we'll quickly take people's results and then we'll finish up and let people go about their days and you get to to get have your dawn hopefully at the moment it looks like two and three right that trying to grapple with climate change um and you know plus um the rise of the global south um, seems to be the way it's likely to go but I get to be a historian, which means I get to be judged on my interpretations of the past oh, rather than on my wrong <laughs> forecasts you know, of the future. M- many I mean, you'll notice that the book does not have a what's happening next. Absolutely. Yes. It was my co-author, Steve Cohen, who strongly said I should not do that. That adding of what next chapter looks ludicrous. The chapter looks ludicrous in six months, no matter what you write. And it also impairs the integrity and the authority of the entire book. As it is, I can write different versions of what would be the what next chapter every two years for the rest of my life. And so hopefully have a steady meal ticket. <laughs> Very good. OK, that's a good long term decision making. OK, well, let's see what the, let's see what the public, the punters thought was the answer about what the 21st century has in store. It's all anonymous, so you don't have your reputations damaged by getting it wrong. You'll all be glad to know. There. So let's bring up the results of the poll and then we shall uh, wrap up if we can. Here we go. What did you say? So, yeah, I think that is, I think that is, um, people are less worried about, well, no, I mean, that, that one, this shows uncertainty. All these yes. things are going to be going on, obviously, to some degree. They'll probably be at the fore at different times. But I think well, it at... shows that people are worried about the right things. That's very good. Do you know, I remember. 
when was it back in 2005 you know i was hiking through the mountains uh through the rocky mountains of wyoming um in company with curiously enough larry summers and gene sperling and who do we run into but tim geithner <laughs> that is diversity <laughs> <laughs> then chair of the then president of the New York Fed. Yeah. And so you do what you do when you run into Tim Geithner and the most, some of the most beautiful mountains of the world. You start arguing with him about systemic risk. Um, and Geithner said that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was very well positioned to guard against the principal sources of systemic risk which at that time were the risk of a global financial dollar crisis and the finding that New York banks for an exchange derivative portfolios were totally out of whack. Um, and Geithner was right, that was not the risk, but he went on to say something true, which is that it's the risks you don't recognize that are the risks that are gonna get you. Yeah. And that I'm not worried, Geithner said about, um, you know, a dollar crisis, I'm worried about something I don't know that I need to be worried about. Well, that turned out to be and, right. and we're so worried about populism and about global warming makes me very hopeful that we'll figure out how to deal with those problems. Well, that is a very, that's a great optimism point to end on. Okay. We'll solve those two sure. enormous uh, problems. Look, on behalf of everyone that's been joining us today, we should say thank you very much to Brad DeLong for spending his time with us today, for writing a book that's, as we were discussing earlier, taken a while to put together, drawing on lots of things you've written and thought about over the mm -hmm. years, and it's given all of us a lot of food for thought about okay. what is the economic history of the phase where Queen Elizabeth was overseeing our Prime Minister. So thank you very much, Brad. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. That's great. And I hope you'll uh, join those us. Those of you who buy the book, I hope you greatly yeah. enjoy it. I hope it doesn't disappoint you. And go to the website for your discounts, everyone. That is our, that will leave that as our money off is our final thought for the day. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.